welcome to a new installment of SFF 180 Classics, reviews of older books that are considered foundational, influential, standing the test of time, and inspiring later generations of writers. On today's episode, a fateful love story from the Welsh myth cycle known as the Mabinogion is brought into the modern era in Alan Garner's haunting 1967 tale, the Owl Service. Hello again, everyone. Thomas here, your host as always. It's wonderful to be back. Thank you all so much for joining me. I first attempted to read and review The Owl Service more than 20 years ago, in the earliest days of my legacy website, and I can't think of many other instances where I was so outmatched and out of my league. To say I simply failed to process Garner's reimagining of ancient Welsh myth placed in a 20th century context would be the greatest of understatements. Now, age and experience have allowed me to fully push past my cultural unfamiliarity and meet this stark and haunting tale on its own terms. While Garner lacks the accessibility and universal appeal of his Contemporary Susan Cooper, whose book Oversee Under Stone shares many conceptual and tonal similarities with this book, The Owl Service is a unique and striking story that staunchly refuses to underestimate its readers. This is a story that might well have influenced such writers as Charles DeLint, Peter S. Beagle, Guy Gavriel Kay, or Tim Powers. You can even see traces of Garner in books like uh, Megan Lindholm's Wizard of the Pigeons. Garner takes a low fantasy approach, where magic and myth exist in the cracks and the crannies of mundane real life, to a story that examines class resentments and interpersonal family dynamics. And though The Owl Service has been considered a book for young readers ever since its inception, its themes, style, and narrative approach feel very grown up. Garner employs surprisingly little exposition, and the text isn't very descriptive until Garner needs to trowel on the atmosphere in the climactic chapters. Our protagonists, their relationships, and the unfolding supernatural mystery must be gleaned by the reader from dialogue and minimal action. Now, if Garner knew he was writing for kids, he had profound respect for the literacy of his young readers, and I suspect back in the day it was deserved. Our trio of protagonists are in their mid-teens. The story unfolds in an old family estate in Wales, left to Alison by her still-living father to avoid paying estate taxes. Now, Alison and Roger are step-siblings, and Gwyn is a Welsh boy and the son of the housekeeper Nancy. Now, you getting all this? Roger's mother shamed the family with her infidelities, and his father, Clive, is now remarried to Alison's mother, Margaret, who, in a very interesting choice, is never seen, though frequently discussed. And the gardener, Hugh Halfbacon, is presented as a simpleton, and a yokel, and modern readers with their greater awareness of tropes will probably figure out easily that he'll turn out to be the wise sage who knows far more than other characters suspect. The story begins when Allison and Gwyn hear some curious scratching coming from above her bedroom ceiling. Finding a hatchway to the musty attic, they discover an old dinner service with plates and saucers featuring intricate designs of what appear to be owls. Now, this discovery deeply perturbs Gwyn's mother, Nancy. Allison begins sketching the designs and folds the resulting drawings into paper owls, only to make the startling discovery that the designs disappear from the plates, and the paper owls soon also disappear. Meanwhile, in the billiard room, plaster falls from the wall, revealing the image of an enigmatic woman made of flowers. And here we learn about local legend. And buckle up, because this is where you get to listen to me mangle the pronunciation of a bunch of Welsh names. The tragic story of Blodeweth from the fourth branch of the Mabinogion. She was a woman made from flowers by a magician for the hero Thuthogifus, I think, who had been cursed never to marry a human woman. But Blodeweth betrayed Thu by falling in love with the warrior Gronu Peber. I'm so sorry. Anyway, the two of them plotted Thu's murder, but Thu came back in the form of an eagle, and after being restored to human form by Gwydion, the mage who originally created Blodeweth, Thu avenged himself against Gronu by throwing his spear at the man with such force that it pierced a standing stone he was hiding behind. I suppose if you're going to kill a Welsh warlord and steal his magical flower wife, you had better do the job right the first time. Back to the 1960s, Gwen and Allison spend more time together, much to the disapproval of Nancy and Roger. But anything like a budding romance between the two is played 
very low key, right? Not like the strict adherence to genre romance formula that we see in 21st century romanticy. And Roger's dislike of Gwyn is all about class arrogance. Roger mocks Gwyn's desire to rise above his station, so to speak, by studying elocution records and making plans to attend school in England so he won't be stuck as a shopkeeper in Wales. Gwen's mother Nancy also holds deep resentments, as we learn that she was engaged to marry the original owner of the estate before his untimely death, which would have made her the lady of the house and not just its domestic. Nancy has a lot of anger, but is easily persuaded not to resign right up until she can't bear it any longer by large cash handouts from Clive. But the theme of love and betrayal takes center stage, as Allison and Gwen learn that by sketching the designs on the Owl Service, she has managed to free the spirit of Blodeweth, and an ancient curse passed down the family bloodline will be forced to play out the Flower Woman's tragedy all over again. Tensions between the characters, whom I must admit many readers will find challenging to like, <laughs> are effectively dramatized as the environment descends into stormy chaos. And while the ending feels quite abrupt and arguably maybe a little bit anticlimactic overall, this is an absorbing and multi-layered tale that demands attentive reading, and in its best scenes, Garner conveys the soul-crushing emotional trauma of love lost and unfulfilled like few of his peers. If you've never heard of the Owl Service, you might find it worth tracking down, if only to experience a storyteller who very probably inspired many fantasy writers you enjoy today. And there you have it. And that's all I've got for this episode of SFF 180 Classics. You guys know the drill. These are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you've not done so. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Buy Me A Coffee page, whole new way to support the channel if you like, with no commitment, or uh, by getting t-shirts at my Tee Public store, and finally, at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army gets little perks occasionally if I finish them on time, early access to some of my videos, but mainly the point of all of the crowdfunding options I offer is to help me pay Matt Olson, my brilliantly gifted and talented channel artist who does all these glorious thumbnails and things for me. He has been with me ever since the inception of this channel more than 10 years ago, and I feel very, very fortunate to still be working with him. So thank you all for the added support, if in, in, in truth you choose to do it. And I want to thank all the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, stay safe, stay healthy, don't steal anybody's flower wife, and happy reading. Music